Good afternoon and welcome to the overview of the Get Focused, Stay Focused follow-up modules, part three of a six-part series. To begin, we will start with welcome and introductions. My name is Erin Hansen, and I had the privilege of implementing the first dual enrollment freshman transition course and being the Get Focus, Stay Focus coordinator who piloted and implemented the follow-up modules. I really look forward to sharing the practical strategies um, and as well as the obstacles that we experience, and hopefully you will come away from this webinar feeling um, prepared to implement module one. We will then review the webinar series. We'll go over implementation strategies for Get Focus, Stay Focus Module 1, and we will have some time for questions and answers. So this is part three in the six-part series. The first webinar was focused on an overview of the modules. So what was the content of the modules and some brief descriptions of how you might implement it. The second webinar focused on implementation strategies, including placement and timing of when the modules should be implemented. Today we're going to focus on the review of Module 1, and later there will be a mod, um, webinar on Module 2 and 3, and the, the final webinar focuses on counselor integration. For today's webinar, it may be helpful to have a Get Focus, Stay Focus program and instructional manual. If you do not have one, do not worry, but I do recommend getting it. It has a lot of helpful tools. Um, it has a section that's dedicated to detailed lesson plans, so it's really helpful to have, as well as the Get Focus, Stay Focus module one. So prior to jumping into module one, I want to make sure that everyone understands the scope and sequence of the modules. And so what you'll see here is the design of the modules. You'll see the 16 lessons, and then to the right, module 1, module 2, and module 3. Each module has 16 lessons, and this equals one unit of optional dual enrollment credit. Now, dual enrollment is not necessary for the follow-up module, but of course it's an added benefit. So if you have your Get Focus, Stay Focus module, I would like you to turn to 6-20 where you will see this handout. This is one of the best handouts to help people understand what is the content of the follow-up modules. For those of you who do not, I know it's small, but I would like you to take a minute and look um, at module one going down and then look across and see how each module builds upon the previous one. I will give you a few minutes to do so. All right, well, I hope you had a chance to review the scope and sequence of the modules, and I hope you see how each lesson builds upon each other. I also hope that you recognize how so much of the information that's in this modules, we as teachers are often squeezing into our curriculum um, each year. I am an English teacher. As an 11th grade teacher, I always found myself incorporating the personal statement, um, answering questions on college going. And so what I hope you see is how these modules um, can actually justify teaching that because they are aligned with the Common Core State Standards for English Language Arts. So you're teaching them the college and career readiness skills while meeting the standards for English Language Arts. We really believe that each time students review, revisit, and update their tenure plan, it becomes more meaningful and therefore more motivational. And our goal is to help students find their intrinsic motivation and to see how school is relevant to them. Also, having the plans online makes quantitative data readily available to appropriate faculty members for academic coaching and counseling sessions. At Carpinteria High School, the tenure plan is used to identify the careers that our students are interested in and the industry sectors, and then we create career panels, field trips, using that information. So it's really important to recognize that you can mine the data in tenure plan and help create um, individualized opportunities for students to explore the, the fields and the industries that they're most interested in. Also, our academic counselors have 
used it for group counseling for our 10th graders during the summer. So they'll have parents and students come in to the computer lab. Um, they will go over the A through G requirements and help students uh, create a plan for the courses they're going to take. And then they'll have students log in to their 10-year plan and share it with their parents. And this is a really wonderful opportunity to invite parents who are important stakeholders into the classroom and help them to see um, that the school is creating a path for students to help to identify college and career skills um, and help them to determine the direction they want to go for their future. I think it's also really important to recognize that each of the module builds upon the previous year. And so you can see here in module one how to conduct online research for post-secondary options and how to afford college regardless of individual circumstances. In module two, it gets a little more specific. They begin to complete a college comparison spreadsheet, and they look at 30 ways to reduce college costs. And then in Module 3, they develop their college planning timeline and action checklist. Here you see a focus on college. I want to point out that this curriculum does not just validate college going, but post-secondary education. That could be a certificate, uh, apprenticeship, going into the military, and it really helps students to identify the different options in regards to post-secondary education. Every module is designed in a similar way. It starts and finishes, finishes with structured activities for updating te students' 10-year plans. So they review keystone activities from the previous year at the start of the module, and they reflect on how they've grown throughout the module. Also, all of the lessons are taking place within the 10-year plan, and it's essentially a closed research pro pro um, process or report where they're going through and they're saying, okay, what are the highest demand industry sectors? And it leads them to links that they can then research and then um, read, analyze, and synthesize that information. So we always get questions, and this, mod, this webinar doesn't focus as much on implementation, but there are different ways to implement, and it depends upon the site that you're at. Some of those ways are an advisory extended learning where all teachers teach the follow-up modules. So for example, you would have a grade specific advisory, 10th grade let's say, and you would teach all of the 10th grade teachers. Um, you provide professional development so they would understand the content of the modules and they would teach their students that within the advisory. A second option is advisory extended learning with master teachers. So all teachers have grade specific advisories. However, for three weeks during the module, they would go to a master teacher who would teach them the content of the follow-up modules. Um, there are benefits that cost to each of these. One of the benefits with having the master teachers is you're not training all teachers on the modules, but you're training a, a small group. Another option is within the course subjects, English and history. And just to remind you, these were designed with common core standards in mind. Um, therefore, they should be meeting the requirements of the English language and arts standards. And we know that those standards are no longer limited to English to teach, but also all other subjects. Junior seminar is another option where you combine all three and place them during the junior year. And finally, a Focus Friday, where throughout the year you have one lesson um, per month or per week, depending on how you want to do it, Focus Friday, where they focus on college and career going and they complete the 10-year plan. So with that in mind, we're going to jump into Module 1. And 10th grade Module 1 is focused on developing developing attitudes and aptitudes to promote college and career readiness. And I think one of the most helpful ways to understand the content of the module is take a minute and review the table of contents on page three. As you're looking at it, I would like you to star the lessons that you think are most beneficial to your students and put in C next to any lesson where you feel like or you're pretty sure that counselors already are teaching this um, whether in workshop form or in drop-ins or push-ins to the classroom. So again, star the lessons that you think is most benefit, put a C next to ones that you think counselors are already teaching um, or doing push-ins for. I'll give you a few seconds to do that.
All right. Well, I hope that you have um, been able to look over and identify some of those keystone activities. Um, as we progress throughout the webinar, you're going to get more specific or detailed um, ideas for each of these lessons. But again, remember that we will have time for question and answers, so jot down any questions that you have, and we'll be sure to get to them. Okay, so really practical strategies, and I know that some of this goes without saying, um, but because the modules are a workbook that have the directions in them, um, a teacher might take that workbook, hand their, to their students, and say complete it, and we know that that never works, right? Um, we want interaction, we want it to be dynamic, and so we want to encourage you to begin each class by giving an introduction and stating the objective of the day guiding the students through the instructions. These modules are really um, based on online research, so you're probably going to need to be in a lab or have access to a laptop cart or something along those lines. So you're going to give introductions, state objectives, guide the students through the instructions, post the website that students will use in Commonplace each day, and have a goal of trying to check in with each student. I think particularly for advisories, when we're supposed to be building relationships and helping create that sense of belonging, the online tenure plan is a great way to get to know a student in much greater depth than we would have had we not had that tool. So you might say, you know, which high demand career is interesting to you? So try to check in with students each day. Also, some helpful tips and tricks, and you'll see this throughout, is the workbook can be used as a rough draft for taking notes. And the online should be their final draft. So as I said, they get a workbook and they have access to the online tenure plan. So they should be taking notes in their workbook and then making sure that when they're entering information into the online tenure plan, that that is um, free of errors and using academic language. Also keep track of frequently asked questions for the next session and or year. You and I both know as teachers we get asked the same question over and over again, so if you can front load and prevent that from um, simply, you know, wearing you down because you're asked the same thing over and over again, that might be helpful to you. And finally, use the class roster to record students' initial thoughts on their ideal careers. So as previously mentioned, lesson one and two begin with, students begin the module by reviewing their online tenure plans from their freshman course. This is always an eye-opening experience. You will have some students who say, wow, I really knew who I was my freshman year, and you'll have other students say, I cannot believe I wrote that. But there isn't very often that students get to really reflect on who and how, or how they've changed. Many of our students don't journal, and in some ways I think this is that eye-opening journaling experience. I can't believe I wrote that, or oh my goodness, I, I didn't know, I, don't, I didn't remember that that was that important to me. Lessons three through six focus on researching high demand careers. So they're going to look at um, which careers are going to be, have the greatest demand in 10 years from now. First of all, they cannot believe there is a formula out there that can project into the future. Um, I will admit that there is also a little pushback because as you might imagine, the high demand careers are often in the science field. And we have students who are passionate about the humanities, want to be writers. And in no way is this supposed to um, and say that they shouldn't pursue those careers. With that said, if their career that they desire is not going to be in high demand, that means they should work the hardest and be the best at it as they can. And that should increase their motivation to excel, because there's going to be more competition. Um, and so this le these lessons ask them to identify careers that will be in high demand the next decade, create a career interest survey for high demand career of interest. And I want to point out, in their freshman year, they researched three careers of their interest based on what they wanted to do. And now they're researching a high demand career. They're going to write an education plan for a high demand career and develop a course schedule. So this is where they're going from, um, what do I want to be, to what does that look like in regards to my education? So having taught this module, we have some tips for you. The first is lesson three can be completed as a group activity. This is where I recommend that you divide the class into four groups based on education level. So then they're going to, some of them will research jobs that are going to be in high demand that require some college 
high demand careers that require a two-year or associate's degree, high demand careers that require a four-year or a bachelor's degree, and high demand career that requires a master's degree. And they're going to see, based on the education level, which careers are the high demand. So each group is researching a different um, education level. Then they present the information that they gathered. What we found is when they had to do the same thing as individuals, it seemed tedious. Why not make it collaborative and have them do it in small groups and then teach the class? Lesson five, ask them to write an education plan. And we found that with 10th graders, there was a wide range of careers that they selected to research. So rather than having each of them go on and create an education plan, we decided to create one education plan um, together so that they could see what it looks like to identify a school that offers the training, what um, it looks like to select courses, and we focus more on the process than on each student doing that individually. They will have time to do that in their junior and senior year. So we just found it was more appropriate for our 10th graders to do it as a class um, and walk them through the process and model the process, and then later on they will be able to do it on their own. Lessons seven through nine, ask students to project into their future. They are actually going to write an autobiographical statement of their 25th high school reunion. This is them envisioning who they want to be in their future. Um, and you can imagine that uh, for some students, they haven't thought that far ahead. So this is a really great activity. There are some schools who have chosen to implement this um, using a 10 uh, tenure high school reunion, um, I will leave that up to you. But again, there's a writing and a presentation component to the, these lessons. Lessons 10 through 15 ask students to do initial survey of key post-secondary topics. So they're going to review post-secondary ex education and training options. They're going to look at college affordability and are you college and career ready. I say that these lessons are definitely a reality check. So in lessons 10 through 11, they learn the language of post-secondary education. What is a two or four year degree, career or technical certification, internship, apprenticeship or work experience, military or volunteer service? They decide which one they feel is the best fit, and then they begin to research that into greater depth. Lesson 12 through 13 focuses on college affordability. And this gives them some really great ideas things that they can actually do right now to help save themselves money in the future. For example, taking dual enrollment or AP courses, um, taking classes at the community college during the summer, those types of strategies. Um, and so we're hoping that when students say, I can't afford college, we're beginning to chip away at that notion and help them to see that they, they if they plan ahead and are purposeful, will be able to afford college. Lessons 14 and 15, ask them, are they college ready? So they ask them, are you prepared to get into the college or job of your choice? And then they research the admission requirements of the post-secondary schools that they're considering. I want you to picture that 10th grader who loves basketball, is convinced that they're going to go to USC. Um, however, they're not playing basketball this year because their grades aren't good enough. What we then have them do is recognize the admission requirements at USC and say, how are you going to achieve what you want to do? Um, are you prepared? Are you making the decisions in regard to academics that's going to give you access to the very thing that you're dreaming of? Um, so this is a great reality check. Uh, I had students create a poster where they talked about the career that they're interested in, the major, um, that would meet that career, their top three schools, and then they wrote the admission requirements for their top school. And they put these posters around the school. And this is a great way to create a college and career going culture um, and to share that information with other students. So even getting ninth graders to think about it. And we did this prior to having implemented the modules with our juniors and seniors. Juniors and seniors saw what the 10th graders were creating. They started a club, and they went through the module themselves to make sure that they had access to that information. So that's just an idea. Um, and again, the more that you can display students' work and use it as a way to create that college and career-going culture, the better it is for your school community. So Lesson 16 ends with students um, updating their online tenure plans. They've been doing this throughout. Each lesson is in the tenure plan, but then they review again those keystone activities and see how they've grown from their 
freshman year, the start of the module to the end of the module. So what I would like to do now, and because we're on a webinar, I don't know how many of you have the materials in front of you, but this is a great thing to do with your faculty if you do not have access to you to the materials right now, is select one lesson from Module 1. You're going to read through the lesson, keeping in mind how you might want to approach teaching it to your students. And then you're going to turn to the Get Focus, Stay Focus instructional manual for further instruction. So this is a way of you getting hands-on into the tools. What I would have you do next is write down what is the lesson objective? How much time is needed? And I will say that the instructional manual and the, the workbook says how long it's supposed to take, but you know your students best, so it's really important to address that based on your experience. So how much time do you think is needed? Is there a computer lab needed? Is there any vocabulary that needs to be front-loaded? And are there any enrichment ideas? Five to ten minutes recommended to manage the time constraints. So is there a TED Talk or a short video or a cartoon or a clip that you can show to engage them on the topic? So we actually did this when we were introducing this concept to our faculty. We asked them to choose one lesson, to work through it. We then had them, um, we had them answer these uh, bullet points, and then they presented those lessons to the rest of the um, department. So that is just an idea of helping your faculty get into the modules and understand what it is that they may be teaching. This is the tool we used. So as I just mentioned, um, at Carpentry High School, we had our English department implement module one. And we had our history department implement module two. So we got subs, and the English department came in the morning, and the history department came in the afternoon, the subs switched. And we went through an overview of the module, and then we broke it down using all of the tools we had, the manual, the actual workbook, looking at online, and we worked this out in order to create our own pacing guide. And this became the pacing guide that we would use um, throughout the course of teaching the follow-up module. Now, we always get questions of, we just don't have enough time. If it is going to take 16 lessons, if I can only give it two weeks, what should I teach? And so we've created this handout, and it's available to you online, as well as the one I just showed. It has a star next to the keystone activities. These are the lessons that we feel you cannot skip. Um, and so please know that that's available, and use that in regards to the pacing of your implementation of the follow-up modules. We also have, when you're thinking about implementation, a timeline option for you to see. If you wanted the follow-up module to cover the entire year, you could do one session per month. So the full academic year covering all 16 lessons. If you wanted to do one session per week, you would have the module taught over one semester. If you wanted to do it as a unit, unit you would need three weeks to cover all 16 lessons. And then, if you cannot dedicate those three weeks, then you can do the keystone activities where you take certain activities and make sure that all students have access to that content. So again, um, if we were together, I would have you turn to page 557 in your manual and preview the list of 30 ways to reduce college costs. Um, and then after the webinar, I recommend that you follow the directions of the manual and complete this activity as if you were a student. As you're going through it, think of creative ways to approach the lessons with your students. Um, it does not work to give them the workbook and say, go. And I know you all know that. And so um, the way that you can incorporate your personality, your interest, into these modules will make it all the more motivating for your students to actively engage with them. So I've walked you through Module 1. I thank you for your time. I know that's a lot of information. Um, and I want you to know, again, that these webinars will be um, archived on the GetFocusStayFocus.org website. There also will be access to the handouts, um, our planning tools, the keystone activities, and the implementation pyramid. Um, but I now want to give you time to ask questions. And I will be sure to. Um, to, or I'm going to pause the recording, but please feel free to ask any questions that you have at this time.